Recording is on. Okay, so today is October 10th, 2021, and this is the Western Desiderata Extinction Nadi meeting. Um, we'll start off with a roll call of um, our contacts, if you have any, and then we'll uh, continue with the discussion. So um, we're supposed to have a chat with uh, Derek Jensen soon. So um, I'm trying to get back with uh, Heather, um, hopefully this Wednesday, but um, I'll, I'll uh, wait for her reply, but uh, that's it for now. I have no replies from the UK, again, from the probation offices. So if you have any suggestions to other other places I could go, I, I have no, I, I don't know if there's anybody from the UK here. No, I don't think so. But um, I might contact some people out there again, because it's, they seem, uh, other, otherwise maybe the emails are just not right, but I, I couldn't get them all right or wrong. So I don't know. Otherwise, I have nothing else to say except that I've posted to you all a, a little transcript, half of meeting, just as a as a try to see, you know, would that go anywhere? Would it? Because it's it's really fun to do. Um, I don't mind doing this really because it brings back uh, all sorts of stuff we've talked about, and it it can. But I will have to see if it can be of use. That's all I have to say. Yeah, hopefully you can make it more readable or, you know, may, um, get the point across better than, than I can. Just improve on my communication skills would be nice. Yeah, but the format of conversation is interesting because when I was going back on that meeting, I could see that there was me and Gary who were asking questions or interacting with you. You would be sticking to your subject and you would have I just had to edit a few little things in the transcript, like hum, oh, uh, oh, uh, yeah, you know, things. But other than that, it's, you know, that you get in a conversation, but it's it it makes quite a, well, I don't know. I'm not a good, uh, as I told you, I, I, I my my first language was French, so I wouldn't be that good at, at making it into a, a readable thing, but we could, we could look at that later. But I think as it is, it looks like a conversation um on that meeting anyway and I, I i i think i'd like to continue the the idea and see where we go some meetings might be better than others for it i don't know i just picked one at the beginning and we can you can see yourselves what you think i think there's a lot of places we can go with it we could if it you know looks like conversational we could turn it into podcasts um we could do voiceovers and do podcasts. Um, uh, we could do long form essays or compilations into a book even. It's so easy to self publish now. Right. There are but books there's, there's that, a lot of. There are books that are in that format, which are like dialogues, and it makes for interesting. It's almost like a play. I think it just needs, like Sophie said, punctuation, um, you know, like. I skimmed it, Sophie, a little bit, and uh, yeah, just missing periods or commas. But what, maybe 
we should trial it and see, you know, I don't know who, but put it in front of an audience, maybe put it on our collapse or on social media or something, or and, and just see what people like. If you see what I mean, do a bit of market testing on it to see if 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 it goes down well with people. It would be really a nice goal to make it more digestible, right? I'm not sure it's quite digestible, these videos. Um, related to tasks, uh, Sophie had tasked me with, um, well, um, about the geoengineering uh, professor, Kevin Anderson, and I have not had the chance to do that, so I wouldn't be averse to somebody taking on, inviting him if Going South wants to do that. Um, I I foresee some time opening up for me in the near future because I think I'm going to have to give up my job because the jab's being mandated. But right now, I'm still kind... I, I probably will still be working till the end of the year. So my time is kind of um, stretched out. But so so that's where I'm at. I mean, I'm going to try to, if people want to wait, I, I will try to do it in the next couple of weeks. Just maybe send a standard invite like Mike Mike had guided us before with uh, like, or maybe even you, Lord Hugh, had a format about like an overview of what we do uh, to reach out to the contact. So I'm just going to use that as kind of a template. But if people are in a hurry to line up um, geoengineering, um, interviews i wouldn't mind if somebody took it over well, that's great so so from my point of view is um i'm trying to get this response to that sky video out but i it's it keeps on changing on me because the ib and stuff and what they've been doing is having a kind of amazing results. And so I'm, I keep on changing my mind about exactly how to respond to that Sky video because its latest events have, have uh, changed the, the landscape. So um, I, I keep on starting and then <laughs> having to change course. But I, I spent some time with Lionel and came up with a, a good response, but it, it's, you know, it doesn't fit with the the motion and stuff that they've actually managed to achieve, especially in in the last few videos that we've seen. It's getting high high tension and quite emotional. So, yeah, I got, I got to kind of feel. I feel like you have to kind of fit that in to to the response. And so there's, the landscape is changing. So I'm not getting things out. I'm trying to trying to do some more writing and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, um, but in in general, doing doing a lot of conversations with people. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I haven't been. Yeah, I haven't been really churning stuff out. But um, anyway, so it's a funny time. It's it's kind of like I feel the world is moving fast, and I'm not moving <laughs> as fast as the world. <laughs> but anyway. Anyway, that's a, a long-winded way of saying I didn't do much homework. Any anyone else? I was thinking. Okay, so I, just, I was just thinking. Sorry, but uh, I was looking at the answer from uh, going south, saying that. He, it might not be in his line to do that sort of thing. So I was wondering, um, maybe we could ask Bob, he's not there at the meeting, but you know, uh, he's the one who posted Kevin Anderson on, on the sub and he might be willing to do that. So might reach out to him after the meeting and send him a, a message through Reddit and see, would he like to do it? Because he, he might be on our meetings again, he said after this month. So um, we'll see. If he's interested, I, I'll try. I'll write to him. Okay. Okay. So, if unless there are any other questions, then 
uh, Ryan wanted to talk about um, artificial intelligence and have a kind of debate on that. But so, does anybody have anything else they wanted to insert, or should we start talking about that? Cool. Um, so if, if nobody has, has anything, um, feel free to interrupt if you do. Um, and this should be participatory if anybody has any questions or, or comments. Um, I, first off, um, I think that we should summarize kind of um, where, uh, where you're at, Hugh, because I'm not uh, entirely sure I, I know uh, what your position is on, on artificial intelligence. I have a vague notion, um, and then I'll, I can, after that I can kind of summarize some of the arguments that I've heard um, in favor of existential risk due to artificial intelligence, and um, and then I think we can go from there where the conversation naturally evolves. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, okay. So my position on AI is that it isn't really intelligence. So. Um, I come from a kind of an older school that is not so popular now, but it was it, it was debates that I think this generation of AI enthusiasts missed. Um, they, they were in the 80s, but I'm pretty much with like people like Douglas Hofstetter. With um, he, he was an AI apostate, so he was an early uh, engineer on AI, and he came to say that guys, this is not intelligence. Um, and I'm very much in, in that camp. So just to fill you in, and during the 80s, there was all this debate that went on and said, is artificial intelligence uh, really intelligent? And then uh, people like David Searle would come out and said this argument from a Chinese box. So he was famous for saying this Chinese room or Chinese box argument. And what he said was, look, what the machine is doing is doing data retrieval. So it's equivalent to having somebody that's just in a box uh, that can't actually speak Chinese, speaking Chinese being a metaphor for being intelligent. So what it's doing is the guy inside the Chinese box is he knows the rules. If you give him this little question on a piece of paper, he cannot understand those symbols. He cannot un interpret Chinese. He's completely unintelligent but he has some basic rules and a big store of drawers, a big data store, and he knows the rules for this question elicits me to go to this drawer and get this answer. And so that's what he's saying is he has a procedural way of mimicking his ability to understand these with a Chinese answer. Uh, so that's kind of, it kind of bogged down because nobody's, could, you know, it's kind of metaphorical of saying, it kind of goes to argument what exactly is in speaking Chinese then, you know, it's like, isn't that speaking Chinese? It's like, isn't, it, does a Chinese speaker do any more than that, than go to a database of retrieval? And, and so it, it got bogged down into all these very deep arguments of, is this really intelligence that became kind of semantic and etymological about what is intelligence and um, and eventually it got resolved sometime in the late 80s. And it got resolved by this, um, it kind of generally it was saying like, look, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, call it a fucking duck and let's move on. That was, that was the argument. So it says, if it looks like intelligence and walks like intelligence and has the aspects of intelligence, let's call it intelligence and stop this stupid debate and we just carry on. And that's, that's where it was left and went to, off to Silicon Valley where everybody started doing neural nets and started uh, thinking, you know, cyborgs and shit are going to take over the earth. Kind of reaches its nadir with <laughs> Elon Musk, who doesn't understand AI apparently at all. A bit. So there's a big disconnect between the enthusiasts for AI who are very often don't understand it. So I think Ryan's not going to like this, but people that have spent a long time working on AI are the least enthusiastic about it. People that are new to AI and are techno-enthusiastic but not very steeped in technology, in other words, they don't have decades of work with these machines, that they are deluded by this, this kind of mechanical Turk um, idea. So the mechanical Turk idea is you, you're seeing a, a mimic of intelligence, like the mechanical Turk was a 19th century thing, if you don't know, 
what a mechanical Turk was. So they had uh, this amazing machine that could play chess. Now, this is before the 20th century. I think it was. Maybe Ryan can correct me on that. But anyway, it's kind of yes, in the secular thing. 1800s. But, you know, it was people were kind of mystic then, and they were kind of into all magic and stuff, and they were quite prepared to believe that in those days of cogs and gears and stuff, they could have a machine that played chess. And so it was literally a box that had a, a mannequin that would move the chess pieces and people would watch with bated breath as this amazing machine would pick up a piece and move it over and drop it. And, and then it was winning these chess games against champions and people were saying, yeah, this is um, a machine that can play chess. And it blew people's fucking minds. What it turned out to be was a really good little midget playing chess who was in the box underneath. So the mechanic, and then there's another thing to say. So kind of like, you know, uh, if you don't know that it's a midget in, in, in the thing giving you an intelligence, it's like, you know, it's a, that little homunculus of intelligence inside it. Then saying, is that a mechanical Turk? Um, if it was like it was supposed to be with cogs and gears and stuff, and could play chess, was it being intelligent? And then the other thing that got into the bite was Clever Hunts, the horse. And they uh, is saying like, you can fool yourself into seeing intelligence because they had this horse um, that apparently could do basic arithmetic. And they it stunned Germany, I think, was they, they would say, what's three plus four? And the horse would tap with its hoof, seven, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then stop. And they go like, fuck, and there's like, okay, what's five minus two? And it would get it right. And then I can't remember who the skeptic was, but some famous guy, um, famous scientist who was James skeptic. Something? About it, had a look at it and said, who was it? Uh, was it James Randi? <laughs> Not too early, but a James Randi kind of character came out and, and said it was somebody famous, like Lavoisier or something. I can't remember. But anyway, um, the the guys looked at it and said uh, he realized that the horse wasn't responding to arithmetic; it was responding to the people, and it was taking cues from the people. So when when it got to seven, everybody would go oh and do a sigh of relief, but give the horse some cue that he would stop counting. And then, so he he couldn't count. He couldn't do arithmetic. The horse didn't understand arithmetic. But the horse was cued into the, the reaction of the crowd who could do arithmetic. Now, if you think about this, you say, is that horse intelligent or not? Well, in some respects, it's super fucking intelligent. Because to actually take those cues from the public is something that AI struggles to do now. So the, the horse was doing something that was, you know, after that they said, oh, the horse wasn't really intelligent. Well, no, it was fucking intelligent because to get a computer to do what that horse was doing, uh, the computer does addition and multiplication very easily, but it doesn't do predictive analysis on the expressions of people's faces very well at all. And so the, these kind of factor into the debate. So now after this, you know, if it looks like a duck and, you know, walks like a duck, call it a duck uh, attitude. It worked for a while. Uh, what's brought it back into relevance, in my view now, is that a number of things haven't worked. So neural nets, when they started, they were considered massively popular, and they, they thought, well, this is the key to intelligence. The, the computer scientists thought they were mimicking a brain and doing an artificial brain. Um, what's happened since then is the the methods and you know like deep AI and the, the neural net, deep neural nets and uh, you know kind of short long term memory and stuff. Oh, okay, so one of the things that 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 uh, so neural nets failed at pretty spectacularly is they're good at inference, like things like uh, analyzing uh, you know pictures of a few. Black guys to say they're gorillas. <laughs> it's, it's good at doing shit like that. Uh, so I can do graphic analysis and, and uh, pattern recognition that way. And neural nets are pretty good at that. But in terms of general intelligence um, and in terms of doing things like playing chess and that, they're not so great because they're not so good 
at remembering sequences. So if you told an um, AI, you know, how to bake a cake and gave it a recipe, uh, it's it's good at recognizing a cake, <laughs> but it's not so good at following a procedure. So so they they had things like short long term memory and stuff, and that were, that was a kind of AI that gave the appearance of being able to do quite a long memory sequence, up to about five thousand items. But it's it's it short long term memory now has also fallen out of favor, which is all we're massively overhyped. Now finally we get to be you know machines that mimic humans and to the point like the AI movies. And none of these things are, are really panning out. So you see things like Deep Mind, um, the um, uh, you know AlphaGo, and all of these these things that look like they can play um, Go and and, and stuff. Um, and so to an geek, so you know now I'm into Hugh speak. Is you're looking at an alien cortex that is looking at its own procedure, and it's calling it intelligent. My take is pretty much Doug what Hofstede says. It's the heresy of all heresies. Is alien cortexes are not intelligence. They're super fucking dumb. And you're saying, how can you say that? The most intelligent people in the world, you know, Weinstein and Einstein, <laughs> these guys say, these are the most intelligent. No, they're fucking super dumb. You say, they ha they almost like those Chinese box because they have the appearance of, of of intelligence, but it's of, it's declarative in intelligence, and it's not very smart. So, so uh, it, it it defies um, uh, what exactly intelligence is, and that kind of intelligence is procedural, declarative, um, is very linear, but it is testable by an IQ test. So it's saying. So what I'm essentially saying is an IQ test is not an intent, uh, in test of intelligence. In a lot of ways, it's, in, it's a test of how stupid you are. Now, that's pretty contentious because Weinstein types and stuff would say, oh, you know, what are you talking about, you stupid ass? Uh, IQ is the very definition of intelligence. And I say, no, it's not really. But if you go, there's something intrinsic about human intelligence that's or, organic uh, or, or let's call it organic wetware kind of intelligence, and and so saying it's for, it's not working in terms of a black box. Uh, that's just I, it's it's the illusion that you can have an intelligent black box. So in other words, it's an illusion that you can have a mechanical Turk with this intelligence inside the box. Humans are not really separate from the environment, so they're fully integrated with the environment. And the environment is intelligent because it's fractal and self-organizing. So, so that's what intelligence is. And in, uh, according to me and guys like Douglas Hofstadter, is you can't have intelligence in a box. That that by definition is cut off from intelligence. And and um, and and we'll, and it can mimic by brute force. And a lot of the stuff and AI and the software and stuff behind it hasn't progressed since the 1970s. What's happened is Moore's law and the, the hardware. So all these software engineers like me are leaning hard on improving hardware. But we're fundamentally barking up the, the wrong tree because that kind of procedural intel intelligence that's um, really by an instruction set um, is, is not really what intelligence is. Now, to go back and tell you what intelligence is, it's, it's fu fundamentally a Kantian whole that's part of nature. So nature is intelligent, and this you know, sub-component of nature is intelligent in as much as it fits in to nature. But it's it, you can't, a brain or a heart or one organ or anything, you can't say, which is more intelligent, a brain or a heart? It's like, no, <laughs> they, they're both equally. Uh, your microbiome is, is as intelligent as your brain or your heart. You cannot look and say the heart doesn't have. If you put a heart on a in a box and say it's not intelligent, it doesn't play chess. Well, it's like yeah, because it's, chess doesn't fit into nature's uh, Kantian whole. It's like what part is a chess playing robot in nature? It does it's a freak? It's an outsider. It's superfluous to the intelligent. So it's intelligence is enclosed in the set that in, is around nature and bubbles up from the fine structure of the universe. So in these boxes are outside of that. And, and so they are outside the set of intelligent things. I just, so that, that might be really contentious, but just 
just I'll say one more thing and then hand over you, to you, Ron. But uh, the, so if you have a look at what's what, there's the strange because it's part of the, of nature and uh, the universe, the prima mater, the structure of of matter is is where the intelligence is coming from, and it's doing things like Emmy noters, you know, symmetries and stuff, and that's that's what we we're seeing and what we're calling intelligence. Now that 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 stuff has a strange concept of self-reference, right? It has it always has this um, uh, what Douglas Hofstadter calls a strange loop. So it it has this always the intelligence always has this uh, closed self-referential loop in it, and a large part of these uh, artificial intelligence things, the, the the ones that we've seen so far. They're not very good at self-reference. They're getting better at doing things like teaching themselves to play Go or you know, teaching themselves is getting closer to the idea um, that they self-reference it. But they, brains are definitely self-organizing. And uh, the, the machines so far are not really self-organizing. They're getting that way with, you know, um, say, Alpha Go and Alpha Line. They're starting to teach themselves, um, teach themselves. But that's one thing, and I, oh, I suddenly realized I must say one more thing about intelligence is, is there's this fundamental false assumption in the enthusiastic geek crowd of AI, the AI enthusiasts, is that uh, intelligence is easily recognizable and measurable. And in saying it's not, I've said many times about given various examples about what appears to be intelligence, if you look at it in a broader scale, um, you know, you, you can see that if you scale, if you zoom in or zoom out, suddenly it redefines the entire set. So they're looking at a closed set and under a magnifying glass and saying, okay, I'll, I'll explain it better. Imagine this. They would say a chess playing machine, Mechanical Turk, is brilliant because it can play chess. So then by that definition, I can pit it against Bobby Fischer. And then you say, oh, you beat Bobby Fischer. So you say, well, the machine is better than Bobby Fischer. It's more intelligent. Say, no, it isn't. I'll give you an extra bit of information that will prove the point. I paid Bobby Fischer a million bucks to throw the fucking game there. Bobby Fischer was smarter than the machine because <laughs> Bobby Fischer got a million bucks and the machine didn't get anything and the machine won the game. So I just put a bit of information around the chess set. And the same applies with things like, Turing tests and stuff. So a Turing test was Turing said, Turing was, okay, understand Turing was out to create artificial intelligence. I'll just give you a brief aside story. There was a guy called Christopher who was in love with at school. He really adored this kid. And basically he, he it was again, self-reflection, right? Um, but it says alien cortex saw itself in this other kid called Christopher. Christopher died rather tragically early on. And from then on, Alan Turing wanted to recreate Christopher as an automaton. Sounds weird, but that is really what he was up to. And you know, all the all the he, by the way, Turing invented the the uh, the computer, the concept of it, really, uh, and that's why they're called universal Turing machines now. But anyway, so universal Turing machine that Turing was after, his he had a paper saying, you know, like how would you know it's intelligent? In this debate, it's we're saying like you know that was resolved. And if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, is saying like, yeah, but how does intelligence walk and talk? <laughs> That's the problem. They kind of brushed it aside, saying if it walks like a duck, call it a duck. Saying like, yeah, can't get away from it that fucking easily. And so sure, and Turing said, well, if you can fool us, if we yardstick of intelligence. If you can fool us into thinking that it is a human, kill. Then uh, you can call it intelligent. I say no. <laughs> That's a, again, it's thinking in terms of this procrustean frame. It's all you know, the alien cortex thinking in terms of the frame. And the reason is this. Let me give you an example. The Turing test only works because I was actually just talking to to Mike about this not long ago. The Turing test only works because you're looking down a narrow straw. So in other words, you, you have to type. It's only because your, your interrogation of this machine intelligence is restricted to a typewriter that it appears intelligent. 
So if if I restrict your view of the, the intelligence so that you can only com communicate on a very narrow bandwidth, you can only take a very narrow sample of its intelligence, and it is, funnily enough, the thing that it's good at, is lexical kind of um, uh, declarative uh, intelligence. In other words, text, linear text. So linear text, I wouldn't call intelligence. So all these things that are sound bright and stuff, it's, it's not. It's more like the Chinese box. So, so Turing, the Turing test is a false test of intelligence because it's saying it's restricted. If I say, expand the bandwidth that I can communicate with this machine, Mr. Turing, and I'll show you that it's fucking stupid. And so, you know, no, you, you, you'd be very hard pressed to actually get an, a robot that I'd say, is, oh, no, this is really an intelligent thing. And if you could come and kick it and poke it and stuff. <laughs> it would take anybody 10 minutes to, for it to fail the, the Turing test. It's only because of the limited bandwidth. Now, this might sound trivial, but it's not. Think of this. Say I went to a group of 10 people that are going to be part of the test and 10 machines. I'm going to mix them up in a blind test with you know 20 people that are going to test them and give their results, see if they can print them see whether it's a machine at the other end of the interface or not. Now, even if it's a narrow interface, like a teletype interface, um, you, you'd say, now, let's add a bit of spice to this. And you say, okay, guys, after this test, anybody that fails the Turing test, in other words, fails to prove to the test panel that you are intelligent humans, you will be incinerated. So it doesn't matter whether you're machine or human, those that fail the Turing test get incinerated. Good. We'll do the test next week. Now, what's going to happen? During the week, the machines aren't going to bat an eyelid. They're not going to, not a single one of their diodes is going to trip over. There's no transistor in them that's going to flicker at the, that they're going to be incinerated if they fail the test. What's going to happen to the humans? Well, I can tell you one thing. They're going to cheat. They're going to run around. They're going to go and collaborate with the guys that are doing the test. They're going to say, like, okay, I'm going to use this keyword. If if I say ornithopter, then you know I'm human. Okay, so then you just say, give it a thumbs up. If I don't say ornithopter, I'm not. And they would plan and cooperate with the fucking testers and completely undermine the test, and then they'd pass it because there's so much at stake. So if you narrowly define and put everything in a little Procrustean frame and say, this is the arena that we're testing in it, you can make intelligent. But you see, intelligence is not restricted to a box. You cannot find an arena that doesn't have a whole wealth outside that contradicts what's going on in the arena. So fundamentally, on a wicked, in fact, because they're just trying to say this is uh, the, it's a delusion that you can have um, isolated intelligence, and you you and there's another delusion underpinning it, the, the two delusions. One, you can have ab abstract information and then isolated intelligence. Both of those are fundamentally flawed. So these people are fucking on drugs. But they, they, it's the alien cortex that's looking at itself in a kind of fascinated wonder. But you must always remember that these are synchronous chronos, and they really kind of, the way to see them as wind-up toys that are predictable recurring. And, and so... They're as intelligent as a wind-up toy that you just push forward and it goes, da, 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 and people go, wow, that's so impressive. But what they're doing is really what Leonardo da Vinci did in, in the 17th or the 15th, 16th century. Is he made this mechanical lion that was completely mechanical. This is not a lion. This lion is never going to take over the world. But it, it was very sophisticated and it walked out. It could walk out into a room, into the court in the De Medici's or whatever. And then it roared and then walked back. And then everybody was sensationalized. Oh, Leonardo da Vinci created an artificial lion. Soon those lions will be walking down the street. They're going to take over Pisa. But of course they're not because they're designed to do one very linear, narrow function. They don't have general purpose intelligence and they don't replicate and they couldn't. Um, but because these people are superstitious, superstitious and uh, unsophisticated, they were very impressed by this mechanical line. Well, in artificial intelligence, exactly like that, and we're doing this 16th century version of being very impressed. 
oh, look at this machine. It's a lion. No, oh, it's going to take over the world. Elon Musk. <laughs> you know, it's going to, it's going to take over these men. And say so like, no, it's, it's a toy. It's wind up. It's going nowhere. So anyway, so that's my view. Sorry, I took so long, but okay, Ryan, you better go now. Yeah, there's there's so many things I'd love to dig into in that. Um, I, I think the uh, one thing I really agree on is that um, that kind of the definition of intelligence is kind of ill-posed when when it's usually talked about. So the, the Procrustean frame is is exactly um, you know inherent in any definition of intelligence. I think you have to you have to say within this context is something effective at achieving a goal. Um, and uh, the the general intelligence is in any context. Can you do that? But the the problem with that is that um, you know there are, there are certain contexts where we're not intelligence in that regard, um, and something else would be um, like maybe our our gut bacteria would be intelligent in certain contexts that we're not. Um, so it's the um, it, I think we in one sense. Artificial intelligence is, um, uh, it, it, it's almost trivial to say whether it's uh, intelligent or not. Uh, I don't know that it has any effect on, on the world. I think that the important thing is the consequences of it, right? So is, is it effective or not at solving a problem or at, at, uh, at influencing the world in some way that, that could affect us? And I think that um, in... Uh, in a lot of these narrow domains, uh, which we have, um, you know, increasingly you know, our, our eco economics and and such have have forced us into increasingly specialized roles in uh, as human beings. Um, each of these narrow domains is uh, it is smaller and smaller to the point where it starts to be feasible to have a, a program that can do the. Uh, large chunks of that that task by itself. Um, and if you were to say, created an AI that could be a hunter-gatherer, that would be general intelligence. But you don't need that level of intelligence to have a hugely disruptive AI um, in, in our current world, because we are very simplified uh, and or organized into narrow roles. So um, those, uh, these narrow roles are, um, I think, where where we we have um, uh, the the risks from AI. So there are three main schools of thought in terms of the risks. So I, I'll uh, grant you know maybe a, another aspect of the the intelligence or not debate. I think is um, we know a lot about artificial intelligence. We know next to zero about artificial consciousness. So that that Chinese room experiment where you're trying to figure out what's uh, what's going on in there, like the the maybe the difference would be it, is someone conscious of what they're doing uh, when they're when they're producing the Chinese, and or, or are they just doing a database retrieval mechanically, right? And that's something we have no no knowledge of whatsoever, um, and we are trash at at understanding that um, if it's uh, well posed or not, we don't even know. So. They, um, but in terms of effectiveness of AI, I think the, um, you know, this this gets to where we're talking about you know, kind of existential risk level type of of dangers, like you were saying about Elon Musk and, and stuff like that. He's he's concerned about, um, and I think that there are, uh, you know, three main big big issues here. One is um, the uh, AI itself not being intelligent and listening to us is the danger. So um, it, like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where you have you know a simple set of rules that that get opt. If you have a general thing that optimizes for a goal, for example, um, the fact that we put the goal in there is um, is why it's so dangerous because if there's something that can generally optimize for a goal, um, uh, one one example that's um, that would be like I want to do something t totally benign. I want to make everyone happy, right? 
And so you you have this AI that that goes around and tries to optimize for that and ends up, um, uh, you know, forcing smile smiles on people or <laughs> these kind of things like against what you would want. Or um, you know, what's the optimal way to give you another example is paperclip optimizer. Like I, I want a, an AI that does something benign, just makes paper clips uh, effectively. And so uh, there are there are some things that that arise, some solutions that arise no matter what mundane goal you have. One is that well, in order to solve this uh, objective function, the, this this goal. Uh, I could make do with more computing re resources. So I'm going to hack the nearby computers to get that. Two, I'm going to um, make myself not able to be turned off because that would stop me from, from doing the goal. So I will fool humans to make sure that if you try to unplug me that, that I'm either going to blackmail you or do something to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, and three is that, um, you know, basically, uh, there, there are so many, um, uh, you know, just appropriating resources and growing, um, and, and those those things. So if you're trying to optimize for paper clips, uh, it could end up with, you know, essentially terraforming the earth in paper, paper clips because, oh, hey, there's some iron in your blood uh, that I could turn into a paper clip. Let me t let me take care of that for you, uh, and that. We haven't put in all of the ways that it could go wrong, and please don't do those, right? And that's an infinite set. So if we're trying to describe how to solve a goal, um, uh, and something is actually competent, then we're in big danger, because we rely on incompetence to limit the the, the dangers of of the technology. So it's similar to what um, Uncle Ted was saying about the reach of you know, replicating agents. When you only have a horses and stuff to 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 limit the size of Rome, the communication network, like that's that's about as big as it can get. But you have a global communication network, and then all bets are off, right? It the the scope is unlimited at that point. And so the the risks of AI are that it would listen to a human being, and a human being cannot list all the possible negative effects that should be avoided in attaining the goal. Um, and uh, when you automate things, these things will be happening, you know, milliseconds very, very quickly before you would even be able to audit whether they should do that um, or not. Uh, an example from artificial life that, that I saw is that there was a simulation of, of these virtual entities and they could uh, eat and they could uh, mate and create um, uh, create babies and this kind of things. Uh, and in the first, uh, what what you were talking about, the, the symmetries in nature, there are natural conservation laws in nature, right, that that constrain the, the, the environment. In a virtual environment, you have to program those in. And if you forget, then something can go wrong. So in that artificial life simulation, you'd have these, these little creatures that could, um, uh, it, and what that could grow and these kind of things. And they, the, the quickest way for it to um, get utility and to grow was to actually have a bunch of babies and then eat them because they didn't put a cost to having babies in the simulation. They didn't encode the, um, what nature has, which are these limiting factors inside um, of, uh, you know, you, you, uh, matter and energy can't be created or, or destroyed. So, but in a virtual world, if you forget to put those guardrails in, then you have this totally morbid behavior um, that actually actually optimizes the problem and the goal set that you gave it, which is have the most utility. Um, and I think that the the problem isn't actually that um, you need general intelligence to get to a point where there's massive risk and damage to the environment and our, our, our case for survival. In fact, m under many definitions, society itself is, an, is a general intelligence um, that is posing a threat to existence. <laughs> and um, the, the, but what you, you need to do is um, essentially, if you get to better than uh, a human or at least, um, 
you know, good enough to be cheaper than a human at, with a certain level of performance in some narrow task, that's game over for humans in that area forever, right? It's um, like once handwriting recognition is just better done by AI, then humans don't do that anymore. And every little thing, uh, every little narrow task that we do as a human being, um, maybe not the general ones, but if you glue together a bunch of these, these narrow agents, um, and capitalism is really good at doing that, it's taking this library from this and bringing it over there, and then VC will, will back it, and you'll start a company, and you'll, create, you'll fill the niche by gluing these things together, that then you have the, 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 the problem of um, generally these different, you know, you, you don't, you have the problem of what do you do with the slaves, right? What, <laughs> when you've replaced all of the slaves um, with, with mechanical ones, um, you know, how do you, how do you manage, manage them? And I think that's, there, there's a dual to, to um, intelligent, uh, and that's the data that has to be collected in order to train uh, artificial intelligence. And this is where you have, if you want to have a mental model for how you can uh, predict whether the environment is at risk from AI for a particular problem domain, it's, um, it's often you, if you can generate enough training data to, to make it possible. Um, so for things like Alpha Star, which plays StarCraft against itself and uh, beat all the best players at it, um, it it's, it's able to do that simply because they're able to create a simulation that allows them to play 200 years of, of those games in, in uh, seven days, right? And it's, um, but for uh, various things like, say, the law or things like this, it, you'd have to, Create these data sets, and they might be too small to learn from. So those are those are the um, uh, the things that that it, as human life or human beings, we can we go through life, and there's a there's constant data set coming in at us from our senses, and 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 the the environment is constrained by you know those conservation laws and everything. So we we do kind of inhabit the intelligence of nature. In, in that we reflect the data set that we're given. Um, so to kind of echo what you're saying, Hugh, about um, that intelligence is out there in, in a way, um, and, and we, can, we can kind of uh, mimic that. But um, for, for things like um, the, the picture object recognition and these kinds of things, that's actually the computer um, mimicking us. So we go in and we label all the images when we, we do the Google CAPTCHA thing to say we're a human. That's just us giving free labor to Google to, to, um, to replace us, essentially. So all of those different images that, that get labeled by that, say, pick all the bicycles in, in, in here, that is um, creating a labeled data that can then be uh, run through AI, and then we, we are not needed anymore. So that's just piggybacking on our intelligence. So that's where there, there isn't, um, the, the intelligence is actually in the data set that we've labeled. And then it's just trying or, to do- in the humans rather than the to, to solve that, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, so, so no, I just said the, the my view is the, the the intelligence is not in the data set, it's in the humans that actually did it. Like the page rank algorithm and a lot of the big data, unsupervised learning machines. They, they're not intelligent, they, they're piggybacking off human intelligence, which I think mm -hmm. is kind of what you said. Yeah. yeah. Is it, so, so okay, should, should I respond now, or do you, uh, you want yeah, to say more? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so, so reading back to right uh, to the start of what you said then, uh, yeah, I completely agree with your analysis. I, I haven't got much to say um, against it. The, but I can extend it um, and give you a new way to look at it. Uh, so what you're saying about if you the danger of giving artificial intelligence a goal 
that it runs away from is very real danger and it could be an existential threat. So it's especially the, 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 the plot of 2001. So that's what Stanley Kubrick was all about, is if you give HAL a goal that then becomes contrary to the human's interest, it will still pursue that goal and it will start uh, working against the humans to make sure it can reach its goal. So there's a real danger that, that AI can run away with itself and, and it can be an existential threat. But it's happened before and it happens routinely. The flash crash is exactly that. Essentially, the, the stock market now has been ruined by algorithmic trading and, uh, and uh, all these quants riding all these things that cause the flash crash. And it's not really safe by circuit breakers and stuff. So that's though those guys are putting uh, goal-oriented um, algorithms out there that then run away against the human interest and trash the stock market, which is not what they're supposed to do. They're just supposed to make the quant rich, not, <laughs> not ruin the whole game. Uh, and so, so the, you know, doomsday machines and you know nuclear doomsday machines are in that category, you, uh, and also autonomous war machines and these um, uh, these kind of integrated battlefields where where they have. Um, uh, kind of um, drone nets of, uh, you know, autonomous warfare machines that actually uh, make mesh networks and use AI to, to do this integrated battle thing that's autonomous, which is a, a big thing in the, in the military now. So that, that could run away with itself for as long as it can find power, you know, as long as it can power itself. But you, you can definitely imagine a lot of scenarios that, um, you know, in pursuing a narrow goal, uh, with, without enough barriers programmed in or an oversight where they miss some of the guardrails, um, that, that's a real danger I and mean, it happens all the time. I mean, it's just a machine running away with it. So it goes back to Mary Shelley and uh, Frankenstein. So it's, that's, that's the runaway Frankenstein machine thing. And that, now, the, the thing about this scenario is it's not the machine that's the issue here. It's the person that launched the machine and put the goal in, into it. So the goal, so Hal never came up with its goal. You see, what people are, are uh, I think Musk falls into this category is he thinks these machines will have their own goals. And it's like, no. <laughs> they basically, the error is somebody else programming those goals. Now, this is a deep insight because it's, what is that something else? and say, this is a deeper principle of the universe. And so these machines are not self-organizing. They are organized by this other external demon. And this is the problem. So I'm saying, don't focus on the machines. They are really tools. You don't focus on the monster, you focus on Dr. Frankenstein. And so who is Dr. Frankenstein? It is evolved in us. It is our alien cortex. So, so you just give it a name. And so it's, you know, the, the the AI and the machines they're distinct by alien cortex. So it's a small part of our brain that that is really mimicking itself um, in the in the the, the uh, particularly civilization. So now this is important from another aspect because civilization is already an extension of our alien cortex. So according to me, it's a maladaptation. It's it's something that has benefits in the short term, but ultimately uh, leads to the extinction of the organism. So it's maladapted. We are maladapted. And civilization was the expression of that maladaption. So this is a late stage of the first agriculturalist and pastoralist mindset. So it's, it's part of some neurology that um, seems to be an area that evolution can get into. And it becomes terminal for anything that gets into that. And I would say there's a whole kind of keep it mystic and woo-woo, but just call that this fundamental principle of the universe, uh, which is kind of what well, I'd say is alien cortex. But I would say deeper than that, if you want to get really mystical and woo-woo, you say it's Kronos. It's, it's I, Kronos I can and get, synchronicity. If, if I, yeah, I, I can add some, some color to that. I think that... Uh, it's not just woo-woo and this kind of thing. What I was saying earlier about um, you needing to list out every possible outcome that you don't want the AI to do, that is not mystical at all. That's just an impossible thing to do. So anything that can automate goal-seeking um, and, and uh, uh, will subordinate all those things. 
it will make those mistakes that are eventually catastrophic. So if you think about goal seeking and uh, you can boil it down to um, an objective function for a computer is is similar to um, like a a goal for for us as as elements. Let's say we're processing elements in a society. Uh, the uh, what we're seeking is you know the uh, the goal as laid out by say money. So if we want to seek out money, that defines our behavior, and we we're going towards that end, even if that may be ultimately maladaptive and end, end our species, right? So we, we can continue to, to pursue this, this goal that has been laid out without, um, and I think this is what you're getting into, Hugh, when you're saying that um, this is, it's a terminal condition, because if you have the, the case where um, you are, um, once you once you get to a certain level of intelligence and you're seeking that, then there there is no way to um, be intelligent enough to just step away from the goal you were given um, and, and back off um, because that there it's a uh, the problem of assessing all the negatives is much greater than the problem of following the goal. So it's it's an intractable problem to assess the um, the downsides of of achieving you know, you're getting positive feedback all the way to the de to your grave, right? So you, you're not noticing early enough if you're optimizing. And that's the, that's the problem with capitalism as well, is we've made incredibly brittle systems because we've tried to optimize the efficiency is out of them. So you don't put redundancies in because that's just another word for an inefficiency, right? You just wasted all of this to get a get, to get a duplicate of the thing that that you you're relying on. So uh, it we we have the the this narrow vision in what we're doing, and that's the problem with AI and the problem with society in general is that this is our um, it, when we when we define the scope for things to 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 get our goal um, ultimately. People end up trying to game the system and 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 get around it, and um, and it it causes tragedies of the commons, and and um, you know it's it's hard to create a a system of rules that is internally consistent that isn't nature because nature's already there. Yeah, so I think it's worth uh, delving into goal seeking behavior because the the problem I, I would go as far as to say. Uh, just let me paint with a broad brush and then read and then hone in and refine it better. But broad brush speaking, I'd say that real intelligence doesn't seek goals. Now you you might say that that's a, a bit too broad a statement because if you if you think in terms of um, say animals or something in the organisms in nature in the environment. They seem to be goal seeking. Yes, things are predatory. This mosquitoes on the hunt. <laughs> you know, you you can see things that uh, superficially look like they have a goal. They do, but in a funny way because they uh, part of a Kantian whole or uh, a, a completely integrated whole, and so they're not really pursuing individual goals in terms of what we call goal seeking in AI terms. So they have an intelligence. So the goal they're seeking. Is not is not personal. It's for the greater good. In other words, so so, in other words, if you see a, a lion hunting down a gazelle, it you, if you narrow frame it, saying this lion has a goal seeking thing, it's hunting, and its object is uh, and reward is you know it's um, you you're looking at it like an AI system saying there's a learning machine that has a reward and the reward is the the gazelle and it's hunting it. But it's it's not really the entire. If you zoom out to the entire ecosystem, then then uh, you could just as well argue that that lion is not pursuing the uh, the the goal of actually getting meat from a gazelle. It's pursuing the goal of making sure that all the grass survives and they're not the you know there's not overgrazing by gazelles. So then you could easily see the lion as a kind of a um, you know game warden. That's just culling the 
the impalas to make sure that the grass doesn't grow. And you can do that all around until you lose what the goal is. And you say, well, really, it's silly to talk about goals. And so a, a lion is just doing exactly what it's evolved to do. And so it's it's kind of like a goal seeker, hunting a gazelle, but it's also not. Okay, so now when you look at artificial intelligence and our alien cortex, it has a kind of what I call a forbidden goal. So the goals of nature are very immediate and in front. And so the lion doesn't pursue a goal like pursuing an impala, um, like relentlessly, like, uh, you know, hunting the great white whale or something like uh, like Jonah, not Jonah, um, uh, Captain Ahab. So there's, there are no Captain Ahabs in the, in the natural world because they, they'd be dysfunctional if they went on, you know, it's fine if something's hungry and then goes and predates. But something that got in this idea that it's going to um, do some goal of predation that extends longer than its hunger, say, then, then it's getting into faulty territory. And what our alien cortex is doing is pursuing this kind of forbidden goal that is comes from you know the first epic, which is Gilgamesh, and it's long-term immortality. So it's got this false self as an individual against everything else. So it's working autonomously against the entire na natural system to achieve its own impossible goal of immortality. And that's a forbidden goal because it's it it's not it doesn't fit in with any of the other programs. So it's kind of like a rogue element. It's an agent Smith in in the great environment. Now, in pursuit of that, we've made this elaborate structure called civilization. And part of the civilization is making these artificial machines to pursue that goal even more. So it's not the machines that are at fault. It's the people that are programming them towards goals. And so, so it's uh, so the deeper thing is to stop people being goal oriented, ra rather than to try and make the machines safe, right? or, or yeah. try to compete with the machines. The machines, are, you, you, the machines are, are we, we can't wind up in the war of the robots like Elon Musk seems to think, uh, because they are an extension of us. It's we, it's 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 kind of silly to think in terms of. Dr. Frankenstein going to war against his own monster. It, it's he's really going to war against himself. And so, so the the key uh, to neutralizing AI is is the mirror, and that's also the key to neutralizing the alien cortex is is to reflect it back on itself. So you reflect its own goal seeking onto itself, and it, it's it's kind of a cliche, but that's what the movie you know War Games was about. Is you have this. Goal-seeking AI, which is a war machine, and you you just say, okay, run run a war, all the war scenarios against yourself, and you'll see that there is no winning strategy to have this kind of goal-seeking mindset, and so that that saves humanity in the movie. That movie is quite deep; <laughs> it's like considered cheesy as all hell. Uh, it was actually quite profound. It's easily as profound as the point that Kubrick was making in two thousand and one. Yeah, I, I would disagree that the that the um, the forbidden goal seeking behavior doesn't exist in nature. I think that does in in cancers. Um, that those are you know. Good point. Good point. Yeah, I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but look at what a ca cancer is. A cancer is something that is. But but just may I just say the thought is it, it. That's a very good example. Kudos to you for that because. The, what the cancer has done is it stopped serving the Kantian whole, which is the body, and it started to pursue its own uh, goals, which is is kind of um, independence, becoming autonomous in inside the the egregore of this this whole. So it's kind of breaking out of its Kantian whole into a separate whole, and then that is pathological generally. Yeah, well, yeah. nice point actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that that. Uh, there are a couple of points that I, I disagreed with. Um, one was uh, where uh, we don't have um, uh, a risk from from AI or something because it's actually ourselves that's that's the agent that we need to be concerned with. Um, I think that that's uh, if if I would say is there a war between us and AI, I would say yes, and we already lost. Um, 
it, it's it's a like the the amount of data on us that is already out there that it can be learned from is irretrievable. We can't get it. We can't stop it. Um, and the um, you know with with AI, there's there's another aspect that you know we as human beings are essentially we have a very slow boot up time <laughs> to to get anywhere uh it, if um if an ai learns something it can replicate in an update to uh every instantiation of that ai across the planet in a few uh you know na nanoseconds us it would take 10 years to transfer the knowledge of you know basic human functioning to the next generation so um even if there's just a small marginal improvement, uh, like one percent or, or this kind of thing, um, uh, over a, a, a period of time, uh, eventually AI will overtake us in in large respect. It's it's the it's a you know there's a concept uh, heel you'll understand. It's like a big O of of a greater you know um, magnitude, right? So. Uh, in the limit over time, it will overtake us um, regardless of, because uh, we, we essentially are relatively stagnant in terms of our mental capabilities. Um, in, in fact, we may be diminishing in modern times. Um, we have much poorer memory. We have very poor imagination. And, you know, we're, we're delegating most of our thinking to you know Google and these kinds of uh, external um, augments and so uh, I think that you know in in years past you know there there are plenty of hunter-gatherer societies and that was normal and, and it was great but you, as you notice the the societies the, the counterculture societies that tried to drop out in the 60s just collapse and it's because it's we've already become like the mitochondria that can't live outside the cell you know, it's the the war has already been lost in that regard, um, and I, I think the the that's that's something that that we need to um, you know come to terms with. It's it's like, can you, as a mitochondria, break the cell and and try to survive on your own and try not to die? Like it's it's that's the situation I feel like I'm in. Um, it it's it's um so it's a uh, I, I think the the threat there, you know, it's it's very real. It, the other thing is, um, and, and I don't think it's something that can be simply solved through through reflection on the human element. Because once something's automated, it takes the human out of the loop. So you're at risk from something that was automated long ago, um, like I don't know the tax code or what what have you. Yeah, so by reflection, I mean, reflect the process back on itself. So in other words, a anything can be defeated since, since we're the constructors of AI. So if, if you take things like the ability for AI to do automated updates and learn, I, I don't call that intelligence. I, I th and I think that's an important difference because even the dumbest human uh, could do a, you know, another machine army to oppose those machines that could do updates just as fast. But what's more likely to happen is the way humans think, we would find reasons to force the machine to do updates. So all it would do is do updates. And that's the problem with that kind of linear uh, thinking procedural uh, way of, lo of looking at uh, intelligence is the machines have that kind of intelligence and it leaves them vulnerable to uh, humans tricking them, doing things like you know, forcing them to do updates every now and so in processing capacity left other than updates. So um, we have the ability to to see a meta layer that uh, I'm tempted to call above. So we have a meta intelligence that, that's above this linear goal seeking intelligence. And so it's not about ordinals of computing or, or having, you know, you know, um, that, that brute force, force, big O kind of um, uh, getting better than us, thinking in terms of that's better than us. 
is I don't think so because uh, that's brute forcing down a very narrow um, linear way of thinking that the machines do. So in other words, if we came up against them, we would find uh, a million ways to to actually you know get them to eat their own tail, and that's what I mean by reflection. So in other words, you, you feed the is for example, if you had the super intelligence that's gathering all this data. You, you can always make something like um, uh, virtual copies of these data. So, so you, you already probably have a virtual twin in, in many systems from Facebook to medical systems and stuff. You, you have a virtual twin, a digital twin of yourself in various forms and eventually that will become more sophisticated. But as soon as humans turn against the artificial intelligence system or the alien cortex, it's very easy for people to insert, say, you know, twins of those virtual twins, make the machines see people that aren't uh, anyway, make, make um, and, and so you can feed it back to fight its own virtual army that doesn't exist, if you see what I mean. So in other words, right. the machine is always thinking very literally and thinking the data has got its valid, but you can always trick it with the data and even you can even basically make sure that its data is piped back into itself and so that's what the mirror is, if you see what I mean. You give it a you yeah. give it a feedback of its own data, and it becomes self defeating. Because it right. isn't it isn't intelligent enough to say like I've seen this before. <laughs> it basically it will wind up you know eating up its own ass in terms of data streams. In in certain circumstances, that that's true, but I don't think it's a general solution. I don't think that um, there are always inherent weaknesses that can be exploited like that because as the um as the ai trains against itself to defend against those kinds of things such as with the darpa cyber grand challenge uh just some background for those who don't know uh at defcon which is a hacker convention um they, they often have uh this uh military funding for creating uh ais that that art of uh, that do attack and defense on novel computer architectures that they haven't really seen. And they have to um, it, essentially go into a war game simulation with other teams of AIs that, that um, you know, try to, you know, find an open port and ha hack it and do all kinds of different techniques to try to take over the other machines. Um, and this is, you know, this is as, you know, important as the moon landing or anything like that, in, in my opinion, as as a, you know, an event in, in human history that this has occurred, um, but no one seems to know about it. But it it's um, that they have these teams that were, um, you know, attacking each other a bunch of times, like uh, thousands and thousands of times, and, and they all survived. They all succeeded at hacking each other. And it was just, uh, they get so good at this that if it, it's it's not like a constrained problem where like that they've learned from past data. This is a completely novel environment where they haven't seen anything before that that uh, about the computers, and they they can hack an arbitrary machine essentially. Um, and so that's the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge. And I, I think that there are certain cases where there are there are attacks you can do, like the denial of service attack that you mentioned with the updates mechanism and stuff. But as you get, um, you know, more and more cryptographic signing of things, and you, 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 uh, like the the whole crypto economic space, like you, you couldn't say, say, oh, Bitcoin is easy to attack because you know it, it's it's a digital system. Like there's plenty of money there if people could. But um, and, and they they have been trying and, and haven't succeeded. So um, I, I think that the as these systems get hardened by uh, additional um, you know experience in the ecosystem, they will not be vulnerable to us anymore. So okay, so I'm laughing because you. Uh, I'm listening to your alien cortex falling into the trap of what why an alien cortex is always defeated and that it can't see outside the frame. So you're stuck in a frame and you're missing, you're thinking, 
you know, okay, if you put these artificial intelligence things in a in a DARPA contest or any other kind of uh, arena like bot wars or anything like that, you uh, geeks. Sorry, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. But I'm mean, I saying that uh, people that are, think this way, particularly computer programmers and kind of Neanderthal brains, I think they they they're thinking in terms of this is the game, and it's in this frame, and they're saying, look, you know. This is the outcome, and they're forgetting that anybody can step out of the frame except the machines. So, in other words, like the DARPA challenge isn't anything because I can always go and defeat the DARPA challenge by going to you know one of the the guys that are organizing it or something, and I can bribe them. I can I can pay him a thousand dollars to throw the game. I can pay some guy to put a <laughs> put a virus in there. This. You see, it's not the game is not in the arena. If you focus on the arena, you do what all these guys in BitChain and all the guys that are into crypto and stuff, they can't see outside of uh, outside of this little box. And they're thinking, but we, we're playing this game on this field here. And I'm saying, no, we're not. You're playing that because your alien cortex only thinks in terms of a frame. There is no boundary, boundary to this, right? That's, and that's, that's why, so, and so what that means is you're wrong about the general intelligence because there is always a way to defeat that, that narrow band intelligence uh, by something like a Boltzmann law because there, there's only a certain number of ways for that goal oriented machine to win. And there's almost an infinite number of com com uh, combinations uh, that actually will defeat it. So it's what it can win on is such a narrow slice of, say, the real number line. And and say say you get girdle numbering of alg algorithms that could beat it. They're almost an infinite number, an uncount uncountable infinite number of algorithms you can come up with that, that can feed it. They're only a, a vanishingly small, in other words, almost close to a, re a relevant number of ways that it can actually achieve its goal. So So in other words, life will find a way. <laughs> Because it's not like because it cannot think outside that box, and and the people that are enthusiastic about it constantly think by outside the box. So it leads them to be terrified, and they say like, "No, just step out of the box." I, <laughs> another like, thing, please. another thing that uh, even if artificial intelligence could do stuff, there's one thing it cannot stop humans from doing, and we could just cut the power. Like the only the only things that could stop humans from cutting the power to it is other humans. Well, uh, it it can actually stop us from cutting power. Uh, it can blackmail us or no, you know, threaten no, us. No, no, you see, this is yeah. no, no, it, it can't. You see, this this is a Hawking. This I have no respect for Hawking, and one of the reasons why is he said this. He said, you know, he came up with this argument, and it's been trotted out again and again. He's saying if you think that those the the bots can generate their own power. It's like you have to think that through, but it, it, you don't have to go far before you realize that Hawking's not a very good physicist. No, no, no. See, I didn't. I'm not very, making that. Very right. soon you, you, the, yeah, the, the, I, the, I was the, making the. You know, we can. Yeah. Well, the divine beast is right. We can fundamentally unplug it because we these things are not really autonomous. So the idea that these things are going to go around. Feeding off, you know, organic matter to get their fuel and stuff is is uh, is is making a mistake of thinking of a perpetual mobile. So the, the, the geeks start thinking very much in terms of 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 like uh, Maxwell demons. So it, it's fundamentally what we're proposing that you cannot unplug them is fundamentally against very basic rules of thermodynamics and physics. Can I ask a question? It's like, can you really imagine these things having the smarts to find coal and mine it, or oil, or get sunlight? And <laughs> it's like, it's, no, no it's I, I think it would just they take relatively a little time for for them to to um, make it so that very bad damage has been done to us. So, uh, like the that in a short period of time to be able to prevent it from being unplugged, that's all the time it would need. It's not. Uh, it's not yes, eventually. Yes. That's not a danger. Yes. Yeah, that's a danger. So ba basically, one of these runaway scenario of a doomsday machine is is what I'd characterize that that whole set. Yes. So yes, if if 
If we gift, yeah, sure, the, the thing could do a nuclear attack. <laughs> Only needs the batteries for an hour or so, and that would be enough to wipe us out. So it's very dangerous from that point of view. But I, I don't feel that these guys are saying that. They, they're saying that Musk is talking about 100 years of development. He's talking about evolution over, you know, evolutionary timescales, how that they will evolve, out-evolve us. And I said, oh, that's horseshit. Absolutely horseshit. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, because when you're talking about the alien cortex um, uh, trying to reflect, to, to give a mirror image of itself to, to the alien cortex, can... I, I'm just trying to... <laughs> how can the alien cortex see itself? How does it see itself? Does it see itself? You know the way that you tell us in the meditation, you told us we're looking at the phosphines, the phosphines are generated uh, not generated by by your actual perceptions, they are generated by an automatic sort of images that are lights that are coming from the alien cortex. You kind of, I might, I might not be summarizing that well, but how does the? And I'd like, I'd like to see how would AI would. Okay, so let me help uh, you out. Uh, me... You see what I mean? Okay, what so, is so let, let me let me help you out here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let me help you out. So. So the alien cortex can can see itself in other people. So you know it sees itself as an individual, and then it looks at other people and then plays chess against them. And that's what a marketplace is and a battlefield and stuff. It's the alien cortex duking it out against an alien cortex, but it can't really see itself. It's seeing the other. But you do get this kind of Hegelian um, dialectic where you it's it's um, in fighting itself it is distilling out gradually this meta intelligence when the alien cortex fully sees itself so in other words it rises above the battlefield of life and ai and stuff it what it it's doing is it's achieving a meta layer or meta module that can uh, cognize the the alien cortex that it was so an alien cortex is too enmeshed in itself it's kind of like it's enmeshed in its own ego if it can see the whole battlefield of egos fighting egos and stuff, then it suddenly looks aloof from its own processing. So that's what I mean by, by reflection. So this is reflected in things like the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita. And what the Bhagavad Gita is about is the Battle of Kurukshetra, where Arjuna is facing all his cousins, the Pandavas and Pallavas, and they... They, he's saying, how can I enter into this battle to lo the Lord, Arjuna, I mean, uh, Krishna? And he's saying, how can I enter into this battle? And so he's in the alien cortex. And he's saying, how can I go and fight all my fellow alien cortexes, which is very kind of evolved uh, way of looking at it. Then, um, uh, then Krish Krishna's answer is, uh, you know, you, um, is that nobody dies... Uh, and nobody is born. So you, you, if you go into this battle and you and you kill people, you're not really killing anything. And that seems like a strange answer, but it, in that answer is the alien cortex loses its individuality. So by f reflecting individual against individual, there's a meta individual that rises above both the reflection and the object. Does that make any sense? In, ter in terms of processing, it would be, you know, if you if you ask the machine, even an AI, it's that war movie again, the um, the uh, that war game movie. It's if you ask the AI to compete against other AIs, you you will eventually get a meta uh, cognitive layer that actually can see the whole game and kind of arises aloof from it, and then doesn't play the game anymore. It's kind of Buddha. <laughs> There are some results from theoretical computer science that inform this as well. So um, one of the things that uh, we talk a lot about is the self-reference. Um, and the, um, the, the actual origin of why the Turing machine was, was useful and things like that was to, was to show that we couldn't do, uh, um, you know, solve all the problems in mathematics and these kinds of things, the Hilbert program. Um, uh, because if you have the halting problem, which is essentially a very useful, you know, should be solvable problem where you say, I have a program, uh, does it end or not? Right. It's a simple, simple, uh, th 
question that has a real answer. It is deterministic. Like, uh, you just run the program and see whether you get the result or not. But to um, uh, the, there's a proof that that's an impossible thing to build in general. You can solve the problem for for uh, you know specific programs perhaps, but in general it's impossible because all you'd need to do is plug the program for itself in to itself, and then it has no idea how to solve that because it doesn't know which one which program you're going to give it. So, in in that self reference. Uh, it proves that you can't be totally self-referential. You can't uh, totally understand yourself in that regard. Um, there are systems of hierarchy where you could simulate another machine and solve the halting program for that, but you couldn't simulate the one <laughs> yourself. So it just keeps building a you know a tower of turtles until you just you give up. But um, ultimately, you know there are some things that that kind of uh, you know. Uh, interesting intellectual objects, like the um, something called a metacircular interpreter, which is a, a language written in itself that can interpret itself, um, like Lisp and stuff like that. But th those Lisp, still are. Yeah, I was going to say Lisp. Yeah, yeah. but it, it's it's uh, so philosophically they're interesting, but I don't think they're fully self um, uh, referencing in in that regard. It's kind of like a a uh, no. thing. Yeah, exactly. No, Lisp isn't really self-referencing, -re even, but even, even like Carnot and stuff, or whatever his name was that did C for the first thing, he, he compiled it in C. I think the first Carnegie, compiler was yeah. written in the language. So. Yeah, that's that's a but common thing. That's not thing. real self-reference. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, th that's not quite... Some of it was, you know, written in assembly first, but yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, most of the many languages are written in themselves um, until you get a self-hosting compiler. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, but I, I think that um, the it's it's a little naive what you said earlier, where you said the that um, there's always like a way out that um, you know we can just stop playing the game and uh, it won't be this linear thinking type of um, you know arena that that we're in because. What I I think is happening is that society is enforcing that linear arena on us, so that, that w all of our escape routes are being cut off. So it, it, there there's more and more encroaching of software eating the world, and there uh, the 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 areas where you can't just run off to the mountains any Zomia anymore. Like that doesn't work, um, and you know, you um, can't opt yeah. out of playing the game, in, except internally in your own, like, mental way. Yeah, yeah, no, so, no, I absolutely agree with you on that, and there is a real danger. I, I don't mean stepping out of the game as running out to the mountains. I mean, is that you can, uh, you can step outside the rules of the game. So, in other words, the... Uh, the alien cortex is, is limited to the arena that you're fighting the match in. And it fundamentally can't step out of the, the arena of contest. contest. But we, we can step out of the contest, contest to basically fight from the outside, in other words. So in other words, is the, the AI is fundamentally like a boxer in a ring. Now, what, what technophiles often get, they get so obsessed by the ring, they forget that most fights are fixed outside the ring. And so once you realize, oh, you know, you see, they're kind of like guys watching world wrestling matches and believing that all the crap going on in the ring is the only thing. And that, so uh, people like the crypto guys and stuff are kind of subject to that thinking. They think if you can think inside the box, but we can be so fucking brilliant that we will beat this monster inside the box. And it's like, no, you, you can't. Well, you might be able to do that in certain instances, but what beats the monster is basically is we can step out of the ring and go and fix the fight outside, and that's what the AI can't do. And yeah, in fact, I, it'll I, never I, to do it because of I, I, so in cryptocurrency, I would I would totally agree, and that's exactly what the 
uh, central banks and things are, are, are doing is they're just fixing the fight so that the, it doesn't matter what your algorithm did. Um, uh, but it's exactly uh, so it doesn't matter how smart you are. They just say we're banning it. And you're like, yeah. oh, well, fuck. Sorry, geniuses, but it's banned. <laughs> oh, that's the end of the game? Yeah, we won. Yeah, yeah, it's that it's that whoever has the gold makes the rule rule when it comes to the money people. <laughs> right. But I, I think the Yeah, but not so much that. The but the point the point is that people think you can you can win the game from the inside. The crypto guys it's a very linear thinking kind of uh programmer type of, of way of looking at it. They get very angry when you tell them, you know, you can't win the the game that way. You you win the game the way the banks are going to win it by <laughs> just stepping outside the game. They're not, you see, they, I have this problem continually with people that don't understand cryptography and they generally are cryptographers and they can say, no, this is utterly undefeatable. You can't defeat this. Look, and they'll show you, but give you the papers and the algorithms to prove that this is unbreakable and say, of course not. Go and look at Bletchley Park. I just, I just go and fucking bribe the guy that gave you the key, damn it. Don't be stupid. Of course you can get it. Well, how do you think they worked at Bletchley Park? They knew damn well that they started every message with Heil Hitler. So taken from that, you can crack the whole thing. It's like they're thinking too linearly inside the box, yeah. thinking this is mathematically provable that it would take more than the age of 3,000 universes to crack it. Well, that's fucking German. But now yeah. we're not fucking German, we're English. We go and say like, okay, we'll pay the guy that manufactured the machine to give us the fucking details and give us, you know, or, give or us just, the fucking yeah. rotors. Yeah, we win. Just, you know, it's like, how, you know, it's hard to do stupid. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need that many machines. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> but but there, there's, a, there, there's an aspect there that I think is is the, the bigger risk, which is, you know, it's not... So, if you step out one one more layer, yeah, in many different cases, it, everything looks like you know your your wrestling match or whatever, um, and that little frame and inside that arena. But what I, I'm seeing is that the these tools exist now to make that arena bigger and bigger around us, so that that we uh, that the envelope surpasses our, our horizon, so that. Each of these individual instances, where we could individually, uh, you know, just sidestep the problem, you know, are are kind of enveloping us to the point where we we don't have enough resources to sidestep them anymore. So, in the in the constraints of the Bitcoin thing, where if you are trying to play in the game and hack it to get the money out rather than legislate to get to get control of it. Like that, that tool is is legitimately strong in that regard. Just like that, uh, AlphaGo is legitimately strong in the realm of Go. And as those um, those techniques, those automated techniques, um, it, it are in are you know usurped by uh, the state and and various things, those the, that limits our ability to uh, to say no to 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 walk out to, and I think this is where, you know, it's all of these, this automation and everything is encroaching on every single aspect of society of earth. Like it is, it is terraforming us. And that, it, and the more it does, the more data it collects, the more powerful it gets. And that's not stopping. That's what Elon Musk is afraid of. It's not that it's, it's evolution. It's that this is, uh, in in it, it's unstoppable, the the encroachment of of the 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 legibility in, in, to to use a um, James C. Scott term uh, of of the Earth uh, and and how that's being le leveraged by automation. So I agree with you a hundred percent. What you're missing. <laughs> <laughs> is that the algorithm that it's running is self-terminating. So we don't have to go head-to-head -to -head with AI because you're absolutely right. There's no way to step out. The entire globe and large sections of space are the game now. So the arena is we're all in. It's total war. 
So we can't step out in that way. What you're missing is the fact that these are, uh, the algorithms themselves are self-destructive, right? So, so they you're missing the the collapse of the meta system. So running or the AI and stuff is you you've seen exactly this with the pandemic. So you see the supply shocks now. A lot of those supply shocks are because of just in time delivery and all the very efficiency of the pick and place algorithms and the warehousing algorithms and all, all the AI that manages all the global infrastructure. So it can't take a supply shock because it's it's brittle by, by its nature. And so you're missing the fact that as this Byzantine machine gets more and more encroaching, it, it is a, a, a real existential threat. We are in the end game, everything rides on it. But the, the thing you're missing is that it's uh, as it gets more Byzantine, it gets more complex. And so the complexity of the machine itself is self-defeating. So in, you have to imagine it's not quite 2001 and Stanley Kubrick. It's, you have to imagine that, that Hal in the pursuit of Hal's goal is, is, making, is getting more and more complex in itself. And that, that, uh, that complexity in itself makes it sclerotic. So it, it looks very much like the Ottoman Empire. As, as it expands and as it gets more territory and as it gets more controlling and more managing and taxes more and administers more, it gets more and more sclerotic till eventually some guy with a turban called Lawrence can just sweep in in a camel and <laughs> kick it in. You see, you see how vulnerable it is. You see that while you see, it's more likely to take down the industrial system than it is to wipe out what's left of say life at the bottom of the ocean. The, I mean, there's definitely a risk now. I mean, this is a, an all-in fight. It's an existential risk. But uh, you see, just the you know, look at the cyber attacks that all of this is generating. So why so? While the banks, you know, go and get all the cypherpunks and kick them in the nuts by saying, you know, well, we don't care how clever you are and how brilliant your cryptography is. We just declared that uh, Bitcoin's illegal and that's the end of the game. Now, all those cypherpunks and that, they, they will stop playing that stupid, we can beat the system, you know, out maneuver. we can beat the, these guys on the chessboard. Say, no, because they're just going to punch you in the fucking face. Well, they punched all the, well, or if they're about to punch all the cypherpunks in the face. But what's going to happen after that? Cypherpunks are going to turn around and undermine with, you know, cyber attacks. And that's what we're seeing already. So, so the, 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 the mere co complexity of the machine and its goal oriented has the seeds of its own destruction. So it's, it's, it is right back to the epic of Gilgamesh. And, you know, the beast. And, and the War of the Worlds, H.D. Wells, the War of the Worlds, is, is the, the sheer power of the machine is where it's the seeds of its destruction comes. I, I'm not saying you can step away from the game or you don't have to engage or you can sit back and watch and it'll collapse. That's not true. We're in real danger. That, <laughs> that is exactly what you say, is that it, it basically subsumes us. That is a real danger. But... It would be a very, it, it's going to be very tragic. And it looks like that's what's happening. I agree with you. Is the way it's unfolding is the people actually have intelligence. But psychologically, they're not keeping up fast enough with, with the, the rate of uh, technology and technological change. So they're not um, defecting from the system and starting to resist early enough. So it's not a question of, oh, the machines supersede us and, you know, perhaps life is uh, artificial from here on. Maybe it's all robots and uh, the humans are dead. It's like, no. If that, uh, if that happened alone, the, the human, they could kill off the humans, but then they would die soon after. So yeah, in other I words, would agree. They, they are reliant on us. But can they kill us? Fucking, well, yeah. If you don't believe a machine can kill you, just walk in front of a car. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they can run us over, but, you know, Everything stops after that. So it's a very like, yeah. fucked up tragedy. And that's why people need to wake up to it. But, but you see, yeah, Elon I, Musk in that is, spo is, is spoiling the water because he's, he's muddying the waters because he's got this tech fantasy and said, we must have implants or we won't be able to compete with AI. So we're not 
going to face the robot army. He's a retard. It's, it's the, the dangers yeah, of the things that you're I, talking I about. It's, yeah. So I don't actually think he's a retard. I think he's a sociopath. Um, and I think that he knows that <laughs> his, uh, his lies are, are um, it's very useful as a religion to mo mobilize a lot of uh, intelligent people to do dumb things. Um, so in, in, in his, uh, I don't think he actually believes his, his story. Uh, I think he's, oh, I think no, he no, knows he that. I'll tell you that straight out. I'll tell you that straight out. I, I can tell us South African group. <laughs> this is this is a you know catch a thief to see a thief. You know you got to catch a thief to know a thief. You got to be a thief. And this is like South African grifters. I'm enough of a South African grifter to see my own <laughs> reflection. It's like, but no, I I disagree that about Elon Musk is 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 fucking thick. And as I I mean I only say that because if I've seen him to explain stuff like how you know newton's second law and it's like boy he struggled with that and you can see that you know he doesn't understand f equals ma which is amazing for the guy <laughs> as a rocket company but um also i know him i know some people that know him personally and um <laughs> they give me a strong impression that he's a retard <laughs> when, okay. well uh, one one guy I know, he's, he smokes too much coke for, for, for starters. And then, uh, but one of the guys I know, he said, he knows him personally. He says, he said, like, Tony, the guy I know is called Tony. Uh, he said, and Elon Musk said to him, Tony, it's like this, man. We're going to outer space, man. We're going to Mars, Tony. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> oh, this guy's not very bright. Not very yeah. <laughs> well, I I don't know. I I think um, uh, I have a story from a uh, friend of a friend of a friend um, who uh, he he had a a child. Uh, it, his wife went into labor. Went uh, and uh, he was working for Elon. He went back to to speak with him. He says, "Oh, my my wife's going into labor, uh, and I need to leave the office to to go." With, witness this and be there for her and uh elon just loses his shit just uh, said if you leave now you uh don't think you'll have a job when you come back like this is he he's like oh we have an urgent product how dare you just propagate the species instead of going to mars like what's wrong with you yeah um this is a. Uh, uh, he he's he has so he's, he's like not today. he's not whole right yeah, um, he's, he has Asperger's. He's not firing all cylinders, so you have to give him that. Yeah, I, but I, I think he he definitely dominates people uh, through aggression uh, in and just destroys people when they come to argue with him. Um, so uh, it that's the reputation he's got. I know the time working with him. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this isn't about him. But That's, I, I those guys, just Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, they're all like that, man. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, uh, you know, there. there's other people who think that, you know, we're just going to upload to Silicon and this kind of thing, the singularity. And I think that's that's absolute hogwash. That's just Christianity in, in tinfoil well, packaging. Well, thanks, Ryan. I just, I mean, I, I, I would have to end this call right now if you didn't think that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, it, I think that uh, we we need to, um, like, the the whether something is intelligent or not is kind of an armchair exercise, because it doesn't have to be intelligent to end the species. Uh, just has to be just has to listen to us. Um, and I, I think that's where, you know, if, if the climate wouldn't do it, then that would be, <laughs> that would be uh, right there queuing to, to end us. Um, and I think that's, that's my conclusion there. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. I understand where you're coming from. I think it is important what intelligence is um, because that's part of our therapy. Um, so it's part of our therapy and our progress. So to beat the AI and stuff, we, we, my way of thinking is that we have to progress psychologically till we defect from the system and the alien cortex. And so, uh, or, or stop worshipping it. In, in this way and starts uh, working against it to try and transcend it. So uh, contemplating what intelligence is, is important because I think that this uh, automatic assumption that intelligence is IQ and it, it, there's a lot of evils lurking in this um, this false assumption. And so it, the, the, it's, it's well important to ask you know, what is intelligence? Because you, you need to ask, are these people like Jordan and, and Thomas, are, are they really intelligent? Or are they kind of these manifestations of this um, this linear logic uh, that's, that I call the alien cortex, which is, is, is IQ, it's a high, it's a very different, you see, our, our, our society has a problem with recognizing IQ, which I don't think is intelligence, as intelligent. And so I, I, I think it's well worth delving into what is intelligence to make people give up on this program, which is, you know, civilization is not intelligent. And so, so I, I have a the, question. That, uh, it, people don't give that enough analysis. So if, um, let's say we just kept the definition of intelligence as being, you know, uh, effective at attaining a goal within a narrow frame. Um, and then uh no, no we, that's the opposite yeah. of intelligence no 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 that's that's what i'm saying is not intelligence and that that's what i say is is characteristic of the alien cortex and um i i i, I know what you mean uh, artificial saying, intelligence. But i pause it but that's the definition uh and then the uh the uh and then we say the things that are uh you know that end the game that the 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 alien cortex stuff is just is maladaptive and intelligence would then be maladaptive. So if you're a Piraha, then you may not be so intelligent. Therefore it can't be intelligent. By, by my <laughs> definition, yeah, by my definition, it can't be intelligent then because if it's maladaptive and self-destructive, then it's defeating its own goal. So it can't be intelligent. Okay. So the whole goal um, of, of this kind of goal in intelligence is survival. But if the pursuit of that goal uh, achieves extinction, then it can't be very smart. Right, because it didn't achieve it. Um, uh, it, it. But extinction eliminates all, all goal seeking. So it's not intelligent at attaining its goal. Um, uh, if it leads or, to extinction. Or avoiding it, more importantly, avoiding it. It's not intelligent enough for restraint. Yeah. Um, so if, you see, if you the... Know, if the if it didn't, you see, nobody talks about machines restraining themselves, right? They they say like this machine can can pursue this goal and achieve it. They say yes, but do you have a machine that's smart enough to avoid that goal and restrain itself? No one ever asked that. Right. Um, I, if the uh, it do you have other problems with uh, intelligence uh, or or uh, alien cortex type of uh, linear thinking other than it le leading to extinction. <laughs> yes. Are there other problems? Very, yeah, very much. And so so part of the thing, and okay, we're going to have to probably end this one and do this one next time, but the, the, the thing uh, is uh, neurology. So when we talk about intelligence, we're saying like, the f okay, if you're talking about flight, the first time we hear about flight is the birds and the bugs. And we, we look up at the sky and say, those things can fly. And then that's where our conception of flight came. So our conception of intelligence came from wetware, particularly our own. So when they started on this, this path towards intelligent machines, we're talking about Bull and Babbage and the difference engine and um, Ada Lovelace and all of these guys, von Neumann and the von Dornen, most of them thought that they were on the path to making a brain. They thought that they were doing what nature was doing with biology. 
Now, mm -hmm. if you talk to the neurologist, they will tell you that is so fucked up. Believe that there are two parts. The guys that are taking machine intelligence are fundamentally misunderstanding what in what intelligence is and what the brain is and what it's doing. And mm -hmm. the neurologists haven't nailed it, but they certainly know that the basically these programmers and silicon upload to silicon and all this AI, they, they're full of shit. So they're saying they know that what these guys are doing is not intelligence. And they the neurologists are fishing around what exactly intelligence is. But a lot of it has uh, things to do with, is it based on chance? There seems to be some elements of uh, quantum theory, self-organization. Um, but the neuro neurologists know very well that what a computer is doing is not intelligent. Because the if you look at what the brain is doing uh, in terms of self-organization, in, in terms of plasticity, it doesn't make any sense because you can't you know, get the human genome and express it as a brain and say, well, that's a blueprint for the brain. It's like it's not a blueprint. It has less information in the DNA than the output. So obviously, it's something, an algorithm that's expanded to become a brain. Now, how you get some bit of code to expand to be a brain is like, and then do everything like a little kid does as an embryogenesis and all the way up to you know a fully mature brain, and and then still it's plastic. Yeah, uh, then they know that it's doing something fundamentally different that we we're missing. And the the great example of that is there are a lot of people that have had hem hemispherectomies. They've had one fucking hemisphere, half the brain taken out. Now, you know fucking well in a computer that I cannot just basically go and take an axe to my Apple Mac, put it down the middle and say, well, it's doing exactly what it uses, running just as well as it used to. Well, a human brain does. So that's a fucking mystery right there. But you know fundamentally that what my Apple Mac is doing is not what my brain's doing because I cannot basically put a hole in the Mac and have it work without anybody noticing anything different. So the you know in terms of the errors, the way it what what's so, that? Uh, a lot of the algorithms that I work on uh, do have that property that you could take a shotgun to the server room and it would be fine. But yeah, I, fair enough. Yeah, like are you an Erlang programmer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's bullshit, man. They basically, they fail fast and they just fail repeatedly till they fucking overload the stack and die. It's, it's not. Yeah. You can you. I. If you have an Erlang virtual machine and I do the software equivalent of halving all the bytes, right? Yeah. You, you, yeah. It's not going to work yeah. anymore. Uh, there, there are there are uh, algorithms <laughs> that, that work like that with um with uh. Uh, like the deep learning stuff is is kind of like that, where you can half all the bytes and it still works. But yeah, um, yeah, depending on on how wide it up, right? You can't reliably do that. But but yeah. I mean, it's a it, it, neural net is is mimicking the wetware to a fair extent. I mean, it's, at least it's better than procedural programming. <laughs> And uh, yeah. silicon, but so, but the, you see, the re the reason why it's very interesting to pursue this point because um, there's something which the physicists are also kind of always scraping on, and it's it's the the nature of the 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 fine structure of the universe. Um, so. And, and again, I mentioned in the beginning, like Emmy Noto's symmetries and stuff. So it's it's. Yeah. Uh, there's something to do with what it's um, it's self-organizing according to some some rules, and it seems to be that they have to have self-reference in them, and so that's why I came up with that um, that theory of evolution. That's you know you have focal points and and you um, you have feedback and filters, and so it, it's definitely doing something like, like that. Um, but how it self-organizes, um, it means that it is an expression of something deeper that we're missing. And computers are not. 
an expression well, of that. I, they kind I of stand alone and kind of hang in the air. I, I would agree, um, but there's a uh, there's something in between. Um, uh, like all life is computation in a way, um, and the the way that computers are built is a very narrow view of what computation is. Um, and the there's something in, in between um, and is much richer that I think most like neuro neurologists wouldn't understand, most computer scientists wouldn't understand. I don't know that any any f field uh, practitioners have this as as kind of built into our you know education system. Like for for example, even even uh, when when I went to university and they they taught about Turing machines and stuff, they said this is strictly the most powerful thing that computers can do. Like if there's nothing that uh, a, that is more powerful than a Turing machine. A Turing machine can simulate any kind of computer, and and it's hogwash. Um, and if you know Erlang, the the that's one thing that the actor model can do is there's this unbounded non-determinism where it can get arbitrarily large numbers based on the, the time delays of sending a message to yourself that that can cannot be simulated by a Turing machine. You just can't. And um, so you can get an arbitrarily large number uh, without encoding it on the tape, right? Um, and that's a uh, completely deterministic thing. It's just the... Uh, so we were lied to in university, and our view is constrained. And really, computation biology is very, very married. Uh, we we are we're just scratching the surface on how they're intertwined. Uh, yeah, I, I so I fundamentally agree uh, about a million percent. I'm, uh, you you don't hear what you've just said very often, and so it's uh, very nice to to hear you say it. My glimpse of what's going on um, underneath is is something which the best thing we could call is fractal. And so it's uh, the fundamental mistake goes back to Leibniz and in terms of thinking of zeros and ones. And this is what I said, I think, in the last one, is that uh, the fundamental mistake is thinking that there's nothing in something or zero and one, uh, which was... Leibniz really kicked that off, but he got it from the I Ching and Yin and Yang. And I was saying last time that he, the thing about, I'll say it again, the Leibniz was thinking about the Yin and Yang symbol, the black and white, the manike and something and nothing, God and nothing, and the void and stuff. And, and so that's why he said that most elementary bits of information is, you, know, you can't, if you have all ones and all zeros, you can't have information, but information starts when there's a difference represented by two states, and let's call them zero and one, and saying, and then we're off to the races with computing. But he missed something in the yin and yang symbol, which he was really thinking of, that in the white, there's a dot of black, and in the black, there's a dot of white. And what I was saying was, even the yin and yang guys missed that it's not a dot of the black in the white and the white in the black. It's the yin and yang symbol repeated, involuted in the white and in the black. And so that basically, there's this deep universal uh, involution, which is really something which, you know, really is unexplored in, in fractal. But the, the brain can only evolve and emerge, and embryogenesis um, uh, can only emerge, I think, with a simple expression of kind of um, Wolfram-type um, yeah. expansions of these, these simple things that's, here. That's true. Um, like the the circulatory system, for example, there there's more information in that than than in DNA as well. But it's just a simple fractal um, rule that you know if you ha build that protein and long enough, it gets weaker at the ends and it starts to fray and then fold on itself. So it's it has its own natural fractal properties. So it's um, it's a mix of the environment uh, cohering with uh, with computation and, and interplaying with it. Um, and that that's where what's wrong is thinking that a uh, Turing machine can um, can work with with anything that there is because the when when you look at the internet, for example, the wires con connecting the machines, that's not a computable number. Uh, the delays in there, the timing delays are real numbers. 
And so, and the the same with our neurons, the 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 dendrites and stuff. The 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 time delays are you know in space, you know, like a real number. Um, so you can't encode that and upload yourself to silicon because uh, that if you were to try to simulate that by approximating it, it would it would drift. Uh, and the simulation would would get corrupted within a few minutes because the those the the precision isn't isn't there in our computers to be able to specify real numbers. Um, just like we can't do with with our satellites. If you have these are chaotic systems. If you put sat satellites up, um, even though we can solve we we know all f equals ma and everything we can solve for things like you still have to put little rockets on those to put them back into orbit because you can you can't solve the end body problem with all the different gravitational forces and stuff it's a chaotic system so the only thing you can do is simulate out a few time steps until you get your error too big and you have to adjust so like this is this is the problem with with our thinking about um you know computers is that Essentially, it's at that very tiny level. If you're just doing numeric computation, it's like the Procrustean frame at the at the level of a floating point number, where you just run out of precision and you can't you can't uh, express what is in nature. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. So the way I would describe it, absolutely agree, a hundred percent. The the way I would describe it is that our um, version of information in terms of zeros and ones is an approximation. So what mm -hmm. all these machines are doing is an approximation. So, so nature is the gold standard. And nature doesn't approximate. Na nature resolves down to the Planck length and further for all we know. But it might have, ma nature might have infinite resolution, seems to, to me, um, at a guess. But if you, the minute you're talking about zeros and ones, you're talking about an approximation. And everything that follows from that, so if, if I represent you with a digital twin, it'll be an approximation. That's why you can't be uploaded to silicon, because it would be a rough approximation of an infinite uh, decimal in, in the way that you, you're talking. So in other mm -hmm. words, I'm trying to make an integer representation of an infinite decimal number. It's kind of like squaring the circle. It's just not possible. And that's what computers are doing. And that's why I say uh, intelligence is artificial and not really intelligence. Because intelligence is part and parcel of that. It's not a proximal. So intelligence doesn't admit to, to approximation. And everything that digital mm -hmm. is, is an approximation. It, it's, it's a rough measure of a zero and a rough measure of a one. But you, you can see it even in the arrow things. Every time you get a, say, um, a, a cosmic, uh, cosmic ray um, blip, bit flip or something like that, that, that's the cosmos telling you that you cannot have certainty in computing because occasionally you'll get a bit mm -hmm. flip when nature intervenes in, in your calculation. And then that's also why quantum computing is horseshit because it's also trying to approximate something which, is, uh, which will always be defeated by noise. And the noise is saying like, okay, playtime's over. Uh, here's, here's a bit of the approximation that now has a butterfly effect on your calculation. Yeah, so I don't think it, again, like you I say, the three body correct. problem. It's, uh, you can't approximate the three bodies. I don't think you're correct that that intelligence uh, is uh, never approximating. I think what it is is that chaotic systems cannot be approximated sufficiently, and reality has enough chaotic systems. But it, it, that that you like, you know, the forestry and things like that. That's a chaotic system, right? So. Um, it, it's it's more that um, intelligence cannot be applied to chaotic systems because they're unpredictable. It's not that they they are um, so so basically the only winning move is to, to not play. Yeah, I'm kind of warming to this idea, but I'm struggling a little bit here because um, I'm saying that intelligence systems. I'm trying to formulate a definition for saying intelligent systems are not uh, proximal. That's why they're intelligent. I don't think that's correct. So because if you're, if you are a simu you have to have some simulacrum of uh, of the external world in some sense 
to interact with it in an intelligent way. And that's inherently an approximate an approximation. But but do you? That's the thing, is you do you need a you don't really need a model of the world to interact with it. Uh, in in I I think in some for the same reasons why I think Skinner was wrong about behaviorism, I think uh, we we were wrong about that if if we were making that claim. It's there is some representation that matters. Um, in in that you if you put enough uh, you know uh, situations in there, you'd be able to tease out a difference. Um, it's only it's. It's all, it only appears totally determined by not having a representation because you're limiting what you're looking at to just inputs and outputs. But you really have to um, have some sense of, a, um, you know, otherwise, what is vision even for? What it, like, how, it wouldn't have any utility in evolution if, if it didn't so, have so, a... But what's the point of utility? Uh, well, it it keeps the it keeps the algorithm running. <laughs> yeah, but this, yeah the, it's self preservation. Yeah, it's self preservation. Yeah. So the things that don't so, have a utility so the, don't. The point of around. vision is, is filtration. So, so I would say the point of vision is filtration. So you you have a chaotic field, particularly in the visual spectrum, and. What an eye does is it just re resolves it to a discrete point in space time. That that is so a very deep it's insight. It's really a filter. Yeah. Um, I I would agree. Um, and in fact, all I, I'm going to raise you and say, all intelligence is compression. It's taking something uh, like a, a compression that that is not completely uh, losing the the original. So it, for example, f equals ma. It's very tiny. You can compress it down really small to to express it, but it uh, it's express it's, it, it's all of the you know it applies everywhere, and having the um, the uh, AI and things like that is about compressing your uh, the the universe of you know, Go games is is bigger than the number of atoms in, in the universe, but you you still can play it because you can press it down to simple, simple heuristics and rules that that um, that do fit in the in the universe. I don't all of the scientific methods. I don't think that's admissible because hidden in the idea that that it's compression. Is the again that it is discrete information is just a zero or a one, which is what I'm contending. So, in uh -huh. other words, if it's infinitely fractal, you can't compress it. So it's it, so even the idea of compression is is a false one. Uh, so the uh, no because. Um, well, I'm well okay, it's okay. So, well, let me modify that. I can I can compress a fractal, but in in kind of the z equals z squared plus one kind of way. It's basically I can mm -hmm. express uh, an some a c that will expand to an infinite fractal. If that's yeah. what you mean by, by compressible, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, that, but in the infinite, my problem is. But, but, uh, but, but the, my problem is that you can't take something like the, the hydrogen atom and and find a compressor algorithm that will express it. So correct. in other words, it's kind correct. of against so, Gödel. But. Uh, but but you're you're kind of assuming that I uh, said that it was lossless compression, where I'm saying it's almost in, inherently lossy. Any kind of intelligence, ex with very few exceptions. But that's so you're what I'm saying is approximation. And I'm saying if it's lossy, it's not intelligent. If it's lossy, it's not intelligent. Because uh, I'm saying that's say, an approximation. Then, and if it was intelligent, it wouldn't admit to approximation. OK. By by that logic, then nothing is intelligent and the except maybe the whole universe uh, or the Hubble volume or something. Because that there 
There is nothing that yes, can that's you. Yay! I, I think we wait, wait, you gotta stop there, man. <laughs> we just did better than live. Man. <laughs> Somewhere in this blue dot in October the 10th, we did better than Leibniz and the rest of them put together. But in, in what you just said <laughs> was a spark of great brilliance that I'm, is just going to be lost down the bit pocket of the internet. But anyway, I, I think that is extremely profound, what you just said there. I think that's a very, very good insight. I, I was sitting here listening. I think we should to all just kill ourselves now. Let's let's just put this up on the internet and commit suicide now. <laughs> yeah, I, I was waiting. I was waiting for that revelation. I, I can see done. it coming. We solved the universe. Yeah, uh, but, but that's I, good I think one. it's it, it is a good one or yeah. a trivial one, depending on <laughs> your perspective. But um, it's a it uh, it it it. it sometimes can be kind of Alan Wattsy uh, interpreted in an Alan Wattsy way and kind of woo. And I'm, I'm worried that that's- What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? I, I mean, I'm only, I'm, I'm like Leibniz and all these guys, I'm only using mathematics to get to Alan Watts. To me, no, it, the mathematics and physics is only a pathway to Alan Watts. What, what's wrong with that is that the the terms are overloaded and people get confused. Uh, so they think that they're using like it's a use mention error when you're when you're dealing with things. Like if you're saying energy, like it's not the energy from physics when you're talking about that. But people say, oh, I'm connected with the energy of the universe, and uh, thinking that that it's the same thing. It's a it's a different term. No, and no, no. What what we did was 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 rare and precious because we got from you know, Leibniz and rational numbers to Alan Watts on a, on a really solid path. So we, we didn't take mm -hmm. a woo-woo step and we got to Alan Watts. And I think that's what's brilliant about it. Well, uh, but we, we when you say something we didn't like... didn't make a woo-woo step on the path to Alan Watts. But it sounds very similar to uh, panpsychism or something, where we're saying, oh, only the universe in its whole is intelligent. Um, and and I'm not sure yeah, that I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm going. Kind of, it's kind of where I'm going. I know that's, I know that's, that's the leap you want to make, but that, that yeah. leap is justified. Yeah. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, yeah, we basically stepped out of the subjective realm of mathematics and logic into the infinite subjectivity of the universe. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. It was, uh, it was it, a nice leap, though. I really liked it. <laughs> yeah, I just hope it isn't a DPD. <laughs> um. uh, well, at least we did better than Weinstein. Will you grant me there that? There you go. I will definitely grant you that. Sam Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, oh, this was well, this is really good. I think there's there's more to cover here for sure. Um, there is, uh, there is. I, I got to think about what you said there because you did raise some challenges that, that are valid, then and deserve more thought. Yeah, but yeah, you know, we got to a really nice place. But will you permit me this, Alan Watsy? Uh, then we we will just do our thing at the end, and you know. Do the woo woo thing at the end, because I think at the end of the day, it's I, I really am trying to get to an Alan Watts destination. Yeah, so um, we might have got there with a bit of sleight of hand, but even so, I think I would like to indulge in that. <laughs> yeah, I I think it's um, uh, I I wouldn't go there myself, um, but I do. Uh, I think it's. Have you seen what the bleep do we know? This movie. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's that's the thing that I'm worried about is that we're going there um, with it. And I I watched that movie early on th thinking this is my you know the best thing that that has ever been produced and I was totally on board with it. And then I just uh, you know I had to slowly back away the more and more I understood about the world. And I I think that. The um, uh, 
So I, I have an immune system reaction to to those kinds of things where I want to make sure that I'm being careful so that I don't get, you know, uh, ha have my mind be so open that my brain falls out. Uh, yeah, no, it's a legitimate concern. Um, but I think we should ad at least admit ourselves, so, you know, at, at least a gl glimpse of some kind of reality. So we might not have got the whole cat, but we might have seen its tail from behind the door. Yeah. Uh, I'll at least grant you that it's uh, it's poetical in a Carl sagan -y sense. Yeah, but see, I, I don't think you can ever nail this down you just get various glimpses and so you you, sh you should enjoy the glimpses <laughs> otherwise you might get you know a million glimpses and um, never enjoy the, the journey getting there totally other words, agree with you I always think that it's if, a milestone if you know yeah if the bitch opens a kimono for you just for a second you shouldn't say ah oh, well we're not sure what we saw there we should say that was fucking awesome <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I, I just don't want to stop there. I don't want to be like Aquinas and just like, oh, I proved God. I'm stopping. Um, I want to, I want to like no, really. No, 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 I, no. Yeah, definitely danger there. You see what I'm, I'm all about uh, is if, if science is infinite and physics is infinite, I'm, I'm all about, you know, an infinite appreciation. It's kind of, I see it more of a, like a love affair and seeing different aspects of of a lover than um, than than being you know nailing down a corpse, which I think is what Western science is all about. A theory of everything would be the saddest thing in ever. Yeah, um, and so yeah, this was definitely a, a wave of pleasure. That's in, in that lovemaking. <laughs> well, well, that's what I mean. Is don't deny yourself the pleasure of the. <laughs> it might be as good as you get. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. So, oh, um, okay, on that note, we better end it there. Uh, I don't know what we've created, probably something no one will bother watching. But, but all right, I think we should just pause and just for our own sake and kind of in the spirit of what you were saying is, is give it up and say that, you know, if anybody thinks they nailed the corpse or got the universe and put it in a box, let's defend against that by just you know, falling still and just reminding ourselves <laughs> we're, we're not that kind of idiot. We're a different kind. Okay, so so let's fall still and just connect with, okay, so we've been really abstract alien cortex and stuff, and we had a nice dance in the alien cortex, but that is still, and the real world is still there with our senses. So. Let's try and remember that the world we're really, really talking about is the eye and the eye that sees behind our eyelids. And look behind your eyelids now. See, see those phosphines and things you're saying, that's what we're talking about. That's the world we're discussing. It's, so it's our alien cortex doing a jibber jabber about what that really is. And so what are we seeing behind our eyes? When we take a breath and breathe and hear, just be connected to our senses that are connected to the universe, the real universe, not imaginary one with cartoon planets and stuff. I mean, this one and only one. And we are definitely a part of it. So let's just remind ourselves that this is all superficial talk about that reality and just connect with that reality through your senses just to make sure that we are talking about this thing, it, her, the prima mater. Now, some people for no bad reason call it the Parama Atman. And what Ryan said was a reference to the Paramahatma. So this is all about appreciation of the Paramahatma, the discovery of the Paramahatma, and 
let's just remind ourselves that we can never nail it down, but it sure is fun to actually appreciate it, love its aspects, observe it, enjoy it, and relish in it as our own self. With the words, Om Paramatmane Nama Ti. All righty. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Ryan. That was really cool. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was wonderful. Thanks, guys. Take care. Yeah, okay. Be safe. Bye.